Hey everyone, it's Jim from Bowles and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 92, we're going to drop into the prototype build of our GU50 monoblock, our higher powered pure class A monoblock that we've been working on. And see how it's going. And talk about the design a little bit. But, but first caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Now, before we get into the GU50, I want to talk to you about, I want to warn you about a new kind of fraud that's online, and some vintage tube sellers have decided to set up a new kind of a scam. What they're doing is they're making beautiful tube listings. They're doing it in multi-colors. Um, you'll recognize them when they, you see them. Somebody spends a lot of time presenting a beautiful sort of front-end presentation of what they're selling. They're not selling cheap tubes. This is a premium fraud, so big money. They, they offer um, a reproduction box, so a fake box. And what you get when you order from these turkeys is a beautifully packaged tube, carefully wrapped up in paper, inside its fake box. Everything looks fantastic. And the whole idea, this is sort of a confidence trick, right? The whole idea is to convince you before you even have any doubts that they have a great product and what you've paid, the huge money you've paid is well worth it. Unfortunately, if you test those tubes, you're going to find that they either test very low or you're going to find that they actually fail. And in fact, one of the features of these ads is that they tell you that they're high testing, ba ba perfectly balanced tubes. Well, <clears throat> nothing is going to be balanced. Trust me on that one. In fact, nothing is going to test good. Now, the, the, thing, the thing about these guys is that they're on all the platforms and you're just going to have to be careful. Watch out for fancy ads. All of the quality vintage tube sellers that are out there are busy. They are so busy there's no way they have time to make up these fancy ads. Trust me on this. <laughs> so that's a dead giveaway. The other thing too is is to be really careful if somebody is new or doesn't have reviews there's lots of people jumping into the tube business and they have no idea what they're doing and so the rule my rule of thumb is if something is looking too good to be true then it probably is so be careful out there folks it's like the wild west all of a sudden okay so on to something more fun so a while ago I talked about the beginnings of our new prototype monoblock. We're hoping for something really close to 10 watts RMS in pure class A. And it's going to be a fairly simple amp, but it's going to have, it's going to be a big step up bigger than the URI. It'll be a little bit more. And the reason for that is a big part of the cost of an amplifier is the iron. So have a look at the size of the power transformer. It's massive for the size of chassis. We could have gone about 5% over spec and it would have worked. It probably would have worked really well. Instead I went 50% over spec and the reason for that is you want a lot of headroom electrically at the power transformer. Remember this powers up the whole circuit. If you don't have enough room with your with your power transformer with its current rating you're going to be always at the limit so oversizing is the name of the game when it comes to to audiophile equipment in my opinion same goes for the output transformer this is actually the same transformer that we use in the URI it was way overrated it's rated for 15 watts and the URI of course is 2.2 watts RMS 
This amp will be close to 10 watts. It's still 50% overrated. And the reason I really was happy that it fit into the design specs of this amp is this output transformer in the Yuri sounds absolutely amazing. So I'm hoping for the same, the same very clean, clear, detailed sound that we've got in the Yuri, just with more power. We're going to use the 7N7 Loctal tube as a driver. Here is, now the 7N7 is the Loctal version of the 6SN7. Most of these were made by Sylvania. That's the, the only difference between a 6SN7 and a 7N7 is that the 7N7 is in the Loctal base which, believe it or not, was designed to be an improvement on the 6SN7. And I can tell you, in extensive listening tests so far, they are quieter. And that's what one of the key things they were designed for. Charles talked a little bit about the early history in the last episode, and he's going to talk more about the Loctals over time. That's, that's Charles' passion, actually, is the different tubes, tubes that aren't currently on the radar. In fact, if he hadn't pushed me a little bit, we wouldn't have gotten into the Loctals, and I am so glad that that was something that he did because they are turning out to be fabulous tubes. Take a look at this this driver tube that we're going to use. Now, this is one of the earlier, rarer versions of the 7N7. This is a bad boy, tall boy, exceedingly tall boy, with a huge chrome cap. And essentially, it is a Sylvania bad boy from the 1940s most likely, um, in a Loctal format, and they sound amazing. So, and these are our new old stock, new in the box. It was something for bad boys in the 6SN7 format, forget it. I've seen a few of them over the years, but finding a bunch, <laughs> forget it. Anyway, and enough to match up good pairs. Anyways, there is a regular 7N7 that's a 6SN7 GTA or a GTB. They'll work just fine in the circuit as well. We're going to have to see how these do actually as a driver tube. Now, what in the world am I talking about? When I say a driver tube, it's tough. I remember when I first got into tubes, I'm like, what the hell is a driver tube? Well, it's basically a preamp tube for the power tube, right? And because the 7N7, like the 6SN7, is two tubes in one envelope, we have two stages of gain available to us. And we need it because this tube needs quite a bit of voltage to kick it into gear. So basically what's going to happen is we're going to take the input audio signal off the preamp. We're going to put some gain on it. We're going to couple it to the next stage, the other half of the same tube. And we're going to put the same amount of gain on it. We're going to couple it again through this 1.1 microfarad and put it onto the grid of the power tube. And Bob's your uncle. Hopefully, we have a fabulous sounding tube. Now, let's look at the power tube. This is the, the basically the industrial GU50. And it's a beam powered pentode, which is fairly unusual. It's a radio tube from the Second World War. The current stock is all uh, old stock from the former Soviet Union. They're robustly built tubes and big glass envelopes. They were essentially meant to go mobile and go to war, unfortunately. We're going to use these things for glorious sound. So let's take, you know, let's remove that whole war bullshit thing from thinking about this tube and think about it as something we're going to repurpose it's going to sing gorgeously. It's going to, it's going to do what it was meant to do. And when I first got into this tube and made some postings, I got some replies from people in Eastern Europe and they said, Jim, hobbyists have been building custom amplifiers, power amps with this tube for years. And I said, well, yeah, but in the West, we're catching up. We're just catching up. We've been focused so much on the available tubes that are around, like the EL34 and the KT88, that we haven't bothered with unique tubes from Eastern Europe. But you got to remember the days of easy to find vintage power tubes are gone, and they're never going to come back. So exploring some of the 
uh, true vintage power tubes that are still available in reasonable quantities. New old stock, new in the case. Um, is That's the thing that we're going to keep doing. So let's flip this thing over. This, by the way, is the standard, our standard chassis. And this is going to be the biggest amp we probably can ever get on it. It's, it's probably pushing the limit. It's close to the limit. I think it's going to fit fine, but we're close. Certainly, we're not going to probably be able to put much more than a 10 watt amplifier on that chassis. So, back here, this might look like a schnarro. Maybe even a big schnarro. Now, the reason for that is we have two power transformers. We've got the main transformer I just showed you. That'll power up the circuit itself and it'll supply 6.3 volts over to our driver tube stage. But the GU50 is a 12 volt power tube, which is quite unusual. I mean, there's lots of power tubes that are 12 volts, but in domestic audio, they're virtually all 6.3 volts. And that's why most power transformers don't carry a 12.6 volt filament winding. So that meant we needed an auxiliary um, power transformer just for the 12.6 volts. That's all it does. And because I'm committed to making kits that are universal power supply designs, that means that they can run on 100 volts all the way up to 250 volts. So anywhere in the world you are, you could wire one of these amps up and it'll work just perfectly fine on spec. But of course, universal transformers are more expensive. They're bigger because they have more windings, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, so we get lots of extra leads. Isn't that fun? But depending on where you are, you don't need all those extra leads. You just need to wire up the amp correctly. So in my case, this is messy, right? Well, now that I've got things basically wired up back here and all figured out, we're going to take off all these extra leads and I'm just going to cap them. So they all get cut back carefully. There we go. And we'll save those because you never know when you can use a traced lead. That looks neater, doesn't it? And of course we'll heat shrink those so that they're safe. So the rear of the amp, the power supply, is basically done. You might notice over here that I've got a couple of bare leads where the dropping resistor goes on the power supply board. And that's because I like to fine tune the filter stage. So we're not going to actually put a fixed resistor in until we're done doing our electrical testing, our listening testing. We'll just, hang on, I think I've got a clip here somewhere. Somewhere. Here we go. We'll just clip one. We'll just clip a resistor in place. That's all you need to do, at least for temporary purposes. We'll just clip one across the leads. And that makes changing out and doing listening tests so much easier. This is going to hold us up for a few days. This is just a stand-in um, circuit board. The real circuit board, Charles designed, he actually designed five boards in the last week. It's been, it kept us really busy. We've got a whole bunch of prototypes in development. We needed a lot of boards. We wanted to update a board. Anyways, because shipping and, and handling is so expensive, bringing in boards from this factory, we did five in one shot. So <laughs> hopefully we didn't make any mistakes. But this is the same size board that the driver board will be. It'll be a dedicated board to handle the two stages of gain. It was actually our first one. It's going to be a two two-stage gain board and we're going to hard because there's so little circuitry on a power tube that probably will always be point to point wired so this is almost finished wiring in here but we're going to fine tune the bias point so we're actually going to put a piece of equipment called a decade box and all that is is a variable resistor box we'll connect it up from here through the box to the ground point and we'll be able to dial the power tube in for maximum power and lowest distortion. It's, it's just the thing that you do when you design a power amp. So what's this big ugly green thing over here? Well this is the main power transformers 
6.3 volt center tapped winding, filament winding, and it's got to come in over here to the heater. So it'll probably sneak under here, and then I'll splice it into a standard yellow uh, hookup wire, and I'll just I'll just make a joint where you can't really see it. I mean, you don't see any of this, of course, when you're looking at your amp while you're playing music, but it's nice to design amps that go together well, that electrically are designed to work well, and that look pretty, right? Or at least look neat. So it'll probably, the splice will probably sneak under here, and we'll just have a yellow lead fly. It'll fly in. We'll fl I love to fly in the heaters because they're running AC, so you've got to be careful. They're low voltage AC, but we don't want them getting anywhere that near the signal. So we'll fly it in like this, and Bob's your uncle. So with any luck, the board uh, order is going to be in next week, and in a week or two, I'll be talking about how this amp sounds. Okay, well, enough of that. Hopefully that wasn't too boring. So what came in this week? Well. A lot came in, but because there's so much demand for the quality vintage tubes, things sell within hours now. Almost nothing of quality stays in the store. Um, high demand quality. I've got lots of quality tubes in the store. Uh, in fact, I've got some Melts Metal Base 6SL7s, new old stock, new in the box, still left, but I, I found a big order of them. People have been buying them up as they find them. Let me just grab one. Let me see if I've got one here. Here's one right here. This one's actually not part of that order, but you know what a metal a metal base melts tubes look like. And this is a weird one actually. This is this has got this weird wing on it that is a higher spec mil spec tube. It's the only way I can describe it. Um, let me get it up close so you can see it. So most of them have a much shorter mica. Anyways, a whole bunch of the 6SL7s came in and uh, good customers who scout the, the, the uh, store fairly regularly to see, um, they're basically they're looking for backups. They've already got 6SL7s. They've got good melts tubes or Sylvanias and they're playing it smart. They know what's going to happen with the supply of vintage tubes and what's happening right now. We're going to talk more about that as the year goes on, but trust me, if you've got some money to invest, get it into vintage tubes because they won't be around forever. That's the, that's the brief heads up as to what we'll be talking about sometime this year. Okay, let's just put this aside and I'll show you a case of one of my favorite tubes came in. Now, I like to buy full cases of tubes if I can find them. The premium tubes, like the Melt 6SL7, it's never going to happen. I've cleaned out, I cleaned out a warehouse, um, oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago at least, and, um, and I got a lot of tubes. But even when I cleaned out the warehouse, none of them, no, I didn't get any full cases, or even part cases. They were just essentially leftover miscellaneous tubes that hadn't yet been used um, during the the tube era that they were made for. I mean, remember the melts tubes were made in the 1940s and 50s so we're talking a long time ago so they're essentially the leftovers from that era. So this actually came taped. Let me just show you the side of it. It looks like a fairly old box Small signal tubes tend to come in lots of 100. Power tubes can come in lots of 25 or 50 normally, depending on. Sometimes they're two layers, sometimes they're only one. Let's get this open. You can tell just by looking at the cardboard that it's vintage, but this is vintage 1982, so it's only 40 years old. They came with a whole bunch of the standard little sheets that the Soviets shipped their new boxes with. And basically it, it told uh, whoever got this tube the maximum parameters, the operating conditions of the tube, it gives the pin out, um, and it's basically a cheat sheet. 
you can see that even though it was a sealed box, the tubes are a little dirty. And that's really quite typical. There's always going to be some dust that sneaks in here. There are some little tiny bugs that love the glue in boxes. They can't get into the tubes because they're glass and metal and they're sealed, right? So one of the jobs we do even with new old stock tubes is to carefully clean them. So have a look at this. Now this is, the writing is in Cyrillic of course, so it's 6H6 pi, that's the symbol for pi, and that translates to the 6N, 6P in English. And this is my newest and favoritest twin triode. There's actually a prototype preamp that I've been listening to, um, which sounds really great. We've got two great sounding kit preamps, and I'm not sure there's room for a third, but we're, we're thinking about it. Right now, we need a higher powered Class A monoblock, which we just talked about. And I've got a lot of people who want a, a kit phono preamp. So we're developing two kit phono preamps at the same time. And that I'm really excited about. And one of the reasons I'm so excited about the, the phono preamps is that the vast majority of stuff available commercially, whether it's solid state or tube, they sound awful. I don't know what's going on with the designers of those those apps. I think one of the things that designers have focused on is making them as quiet as possible. And they suck the life right out of the music. So about two years ago, I built a, my first prototype phono preamp and it sounds absolutely amazing. We're gonna develop one of the kits on that platform and we're gonna develop another one on the Locto platform that beautiful um, 7 and 7 we looked at, well, there is a higher powered version of the 6SL7, and it's called the 7F7. So we're going to develop that, that kit amp on the 7F7. Anyways, these are really interesting tubes. They're twin triodes, so we can have a preamp. So we can have voltage gain, right? So that's one purpose for this tube. It's also, if you look at it carefully, you'll see, wow, Jim, that looks like a small power tube. Well, it is a small power tube. It can push current. So this can be a driver tube for a high demand power tube, particularly one that, um, that needs some current to drive it, which is, which is a thing uh, with, some, um, with some power tubes, particularly transmitting tubes. And that means that this tube can operate in class A2. So it, this, this tube really has three distinctive uses that it can um, be purposed for, which makes it a kind of a universal twin triode. Uh, the fact that it sounds great is just, is just perfect. <laughs> in fact, that's why I built the preamp. I knew that spec-wise, this tube sounded it looked like it was electrically is going to be just the cat's meow, just the perfect tube for all kinds of projects. Uh, but I wanted to know what it sounded like. So the best way to find out how a tube sounds is to put it into, into a preamp because now you really, you hear the tube at that circuit where it's operating as a voltage gain amplifier. That's when, that's, that's when you can hear the tubes the most. Anyways, I'm rambling. Charles has got our discount card, so you're not going to get a discount card to look at today, but everybody knows that we've got cheers codes, and you can watch another video if, you, if you're brand new to the show. Stay safe, everybody. Have fun. And this is Jim from Bells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.